All right. Uh, looks like folks are still trickling in, but we'll try and uh, try and get started. So I'm Mark Nelson. Uh, I'm a professor in the physiology department, molecular and integrative physiology. I'm also in the neuroscience program, biophysics program, bioengineering program. Um, have a very kind of cross-disciplinary uh, view of things. And in fact, my training is in physics. I'm, uh, my PhD was in, in particle physics uh, as an experimentalist. So I worked at Stanford on the linear accelerator looking at interactions of electrons and positrons and uh, that sort of thing. So I've always had sort of a tendency to fall into the reductionist funnel. You know, let's keep breaking things down into smaller and smaller pieces. So that will kind of explain a little bit the tack that we're going to take uh, in today's talk in thinking about what a brain does. We'll try and sort of break it down uh, and then see if we can bootstrap our way up a uh, little ways. We're actually going to uh, build a brain or two. We've got some, I brought some simulation software. Uh, so we'll, we'll see how this works, not ideal. Uh, AV setup. I actually teach a course um, called MCB 419 Brain Behavior and Information Processing that explores uh, kind of the evolution of intelligence. So starting back from uh, when life first appeared and looking at how did the first organisms deal with uh, the problems of finding food and resources and looking at the information processing problems uh, that organisms face in natural environments. And basically my view is that the brain is the solution to those information processing problems that organisms face. And through the course of evolution, uh, brains have become more and more uh, sophisticated in how they approach those problems. So. Uh, that's kind of where we're going. There's another approach, so the, the title is what does a brain do? Another way is to sort of start at the top. What has your brain done for you today? Basically, everything that you can think of, right? It got you, it woke you up, it got you out of bed, it got you to the bathroom to find your toothbrush and the toothpaste and uh, got you downstairs or wherever for breakfast and checked your social media. If you start at a level like that, it's sort of impossible to just try and start categorizing all those different things and say, well, what kind of behavior is that? So instead, what we'll do is sort of break it down um, to, uh, to the basics and, and build our way up. And First 10 or 15 minutes, we'll do some of these simulations, and then I'd kind of like to open it up to, uh, to a more general discussion. It'll turn into more of a chalk talk. But if you wanted to think about brains kind of in their simplest form, they take information from the environment and use that information to guide behavior. So if we made a little uh, like black box, um, diagram of an organism, it would have uh, some sensory inputs. Here's our environment, which could be very complex, but there's physical things going on out there in the environment, uh, light and sound and heat and chemicals and all sorts of things, physical things. Um, and then there's mechanisms, we'll, we can talk more about this interface, which is really interesting, um, to transform those external physical stimuli into some sort of internal representation. If it's neurons, uh, this might be the membrane voltage of sensory neurons, et cetera. Um, and the other end of the interface, uh, it's sometimes called the motor system or the effector system, organisms have some way to act in their environment. Otherwise, if they don't act in their environment, uh, the problem's not very interesting. Um, so there's, uh, there's actions and uh, sensations. And the stuff that connects these, sort of the 
coordination between sensing and action, that's basically the role of the brain, the nervous system, right, to coordinate behavior. So, and it's natural selection is the process that sort of selects uh, for these uh, properties. And we'll come back and talk more about that as well. But, but given this kind of a view, what's the simplest implementation that you could imagine of this that we could put in to a virtual environment and simulate it? And sort of the, the abstracted version of this, um, there was a guy named Valentino Breitenberg. He was uh, an Italian neuroscientist. And he wrote a little book called Vehicles, uh, roughly in the 80s, where he went through a set of thought experiments. And we're going to kind of recapitulate some of that. So let's make a little vehicle that has a single sensor and a single motor. You can think of it like a little wheel. Uh, think of this like a little car, a little race car. Uh, you put a sensor on the front, maybe it's a light sensor, a temperature sensor. Uh, you have a wheel on the back. Uh, you can control its speed. Um, and let's go ahead and imagine that you have some kind of a steering mechanism so that you can wobble the wheel back and forth. Or you can think about your car uh, turning the steering wheel or a little razor scooter. Uh, you can control the speed and you can control the handles. So it's a very simple little vehicle that has a sensor input and a motor output. Okay. We're going to simulate this, and that's, that's what we simulate in, uh, in class, MCB 419. Thanks for that. Um, thanks for not waiting for me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it looks like you're ready to go, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> so. uh, sorry to be late. <laughs> that's OK. <laughs> I'm really that late. <laughs> 12 so. o'clock and 13 seconds. So, so Mark, go ahead. Mark is going to uh, give us an enlightened discussion on <laughs> <laughs> what the brain does. Exactly. Mark Smith, have you been a faculty member of Beckman since? Since 91. 90, so it opened in 89. Almost as soon as the years opened. It's yeah. absolutely been a, a, a central uh, collaborator here at Beckman. And, and I think. Uh, going to enlighten us with a summer uh, tower tutorial talk on what the brain does. Right, so, right. And uh, I'm, I'm violating the rules a little bit. I know there's supposed to be chalk talk, no slides, but we're actually just launching in. We're going to do some simulations. We're going to build our first brain here in, in simulation and find out what it does. So we'll see, we'll see if this. You, you managed to cheat the. <laughs> I managed to cheat the system. All right. Uh, <laughs> So, maybe. All right, it's probably going to be hard, hard to see everything that's going on, but I'll, I'll kind of explain uh, things to you. So over here on the right, we've created a little world. Uh, it's a 2D world, and there's some simulated physical factor that varies uh, across space right now. Uh, you could think of this, maybe this is temperature, maybe it's humidity, maybe it's food concentration. It can be whatever you want it to be. And it's kind of hard to see. There's a little uh, elliptical guy right down there. That's our little agent organism that, inspired by Breitenberg's vehicle, it's going to have a single sensor, a point sensor, can measure uh, physical stimulus at, in space. And it has a motor that it can control the speed and it can control the turning. Now, what we're not going to do explicitly right now is, is sort of talk about the fitness, about, you know, maybe this is food and maybe the red is good for the bot, or maybe this is heat and maybe red is bad. That, that could be layered on top later, but we're just going to watch what we can do in terms of controlling the behavior of this organism in this. Um, complex environment. So the um, simplest thing is for the organism to wander around. So how would we have the agent wander through the space? We give it a speed. And maybe let's, let's make speed constant for now. 
And let's just wiggle the wheel a little bit. Often you don't really have to wiggle the wheel. I don't know if you've ever played with little toy cars and tried to get them to go straight down the hallway. They almost never go straight down the hallway. They're always turning off and about crashing into one. That's because friction um, provides an intrinsic, intrinsic source of variability. Or if you're making a little boat and it's in the water, there's natural currents. Often the variability, the organism just takes advantage of natural variability. Um, so over on the other side of the screen is some JavaScript code. So we're going to, to code our little brain in JavaScript. Um, but conceptually, the computational algorithmic structure could be JavaScript, could be Python, could be neurons, could be analog VLSI. So we're just thinking right now sort of about the algorithm. What can this little guy do in his environment? And you probably can't, uh, can't see this from the, the back of the room. Just so you sort of get, whoa. All right. Here's a little, just to give you an idea what's going on. This refers to this particular organism. We're going to, in a minute, we're going to have 100 organisms on the screen. This organism's speed is one. This organism's turn angle is 0.1 times, this is a random number generator that generates a random number between minus one and one. We've multiplied it by 0.1. This is in radians. So turns out 10th of a radian is, I don't know, five or six degrees. So this little guy is gonna just scoot around the environment. Uh, and on each time step, uh, the angle is going to vary by a few degrees, and, and here he goes, kind of wandering around the environment. The environment wraps, um, so when he goes off the screen on the right-hand side, he, he reappears on the left, and he goes off the screen on the top, he reappears on the bottom. Uh, the boundary conditions aren't exactly uh, correct, but basically you can think of this kind of like a donut, like an ant crawling on a donut, and it can go around one way <laughs> around the donut, or go, but it never falls off the donut. Um, and, uh, so if we made the, uh, let's pause him now, and let's make the turn noise higher. So before it was 0.1, now we'll make it 1.0. That's like 60 degrees. So that's like you're, if you're on your little Razor scooter, you're really going crazy with, with the handlebars. That works. Oops. That. Oh, sorry. Wanderer. <laughs> All right. So there's our little guy <laughs> wandering like crazy, right? Uh, so you're just controlling turn angle. Okay, so let's think about something adaptive that this little guy could do. Imagine that he wants to spend time in the hot parts of the environment preferentially, or the cold parts, or the, what can we do to help him out? What kind of a brain could we make? Simplest things, simplest class of behaviors that you can generate are called kinesis strategies. Kinesis means you change the behavior based on the stimulus but you do it in a non-directional way. In a minute, we'll contrast this with taxes. Taxes is where you make a change that's directed. Like if there's a light and you turn toward the light, that's taxes. If there's a light and you increase the, the wander noise, that's kinesis. You're not doing it directionally, you're just changing. If it's light, I'll wander a lot. If it's dark, I won't wander very much, something like that. Okay, so. Actually, the, uh, the first thing maybe we'll play with is speed. That type of kinesis is called orthokinesis. So let's say we want to uh, have the little guy preferentially spend time in the cold, let's call this temperature, the cold areas, the blue areas. How do we connect the sensor to the motor to make that happen? Should we go 
faster or slower in the cold areas? Slower. Slower. You want to go slow down in the cold areas, go faster in the, the hot areas. If we made a little, uh, I won't draw it, you can imagine a little input-output graph, uh, temperature on one axis, motor speed on the other axis. Simplest thing we do, just may, maybe a linear relationship, right? Motor speed's going to be proportional to temperature. So that's, that's called orthokinesis. It's called positive orthokinesis if we make it uh, monotonically increase. So again, I don't know if you, back of the room, you probably can't see. This is three lines of code. First line of code gets the temperature of the agent at the location where it is. Uh, the next line of code is going to set the speed. So let's just set that to uh, be able, equal to whatever the sensed temperature was. And for the turn angle, we'll just leave a little bit of random noise like we did before. Uh, I'll run that. And um, wait for him to come back from the, uh, so he kind of goes fast across the hot areas and uh, slow in the blue areas. And you'll see again, he'll speed up here. Um, and it'll slow down when he gets here. Let's make 100 of these guys now. Step one, we'll make 100. OK, so now we've got 100 of these little bugs or bots scattered through the environment. Here's the mean temperature of the population, 0.5. So the temperature's been normalized to go from 0 to 1. So the coldest region 0, the hottest region's 1. You throw 100 guys out there at went random. Average temperature's close to a half. Not exactly a half, because it depends on where they land. And if we won't do it, if we just let them wander around aimlessly, the average is going to stay near 0.5. It'll fluctuate a little bit, but it won't get warmer, it won't get colder. But with the controller we just built, we're expecting that these little guys are going to slow down in the blue regions, speed up in the red regions. You would think that means they should be spending more time in the blue. The average temperature should drop. Okay, so we'll see if that happens. And I may not be able to see it. Temperatures, average temperatures drop now, 0 0.38, 0 0.4. On average, they're spending more time uh, in the blue regions than the red regions. How could we make it even better? So here's our uh, input output. This is temperature. This is velocity. Right now we did this. Say we wanted an even stronger effect. What could we do? Make something nonlinear, right? Maybe we really want them to go much slower when it's cold, much faster when it's hot. If, if this is linear velocity equals t, what would this relationship be maybe? T, t squared? Yeah, t squared would be something to try. So uh, we'll go back to here's your code. This is the temperature sense. I'll just multiply it. T sense times T sense. That makes it quadratic. Started that. I've got a little cheat button down here. I can make time run faster. Um, and the students in my class really, really appreciate this. So it's fun. It's fun. Can you make time run 
Slowly. Yeah. <laughs> that would be useful for, uh, for all the administrators. <laughs> all right. So, uh, time, so these aren't, the guys aren't really moving faster. We just sped up time. It's like a, uh, a fast forward. But yeah, we're moving in the right direction. What if we wanted to go even further? Maybe we need like a sharper nonlinearity. So, so maybe uh, what we could do is have an kill input. Them if it gets in the hot area. Oh, you can kill them. <laughs> that would work too. Uh, maybe our input output relationship uh, could look something like this. Could be zero, there could be a threshold, uh, and then probably doesn't matter what we could do. We could, we could have a step threshold, so below a certain temperature they stop, or we can make it binary like this. Let's just do, let's just do this one. For those of you that are neuroscientists in the audience, if I ask you to draw what's the input output relationship for a neuron, if you take a neuron and you start and you give it no stimulus, let's say it's not spontaneously active, then it's quiet. You give it a little bit of stimulus, you'll depolarize it, you'll change its membrane voltage, but you won't reach firing threshold, so it doesn't fire. Uh, so for real neurons, the way they behave is for very weak inputs, they don't respond until you reach a spike threshold for generating action potentials, and then they'll start responding, usually there's a jump. Um, and then there'll be some kind of a monotonic increase and then eventually maybe they'll saturate, but we don't need, the, the point here is this kind of input output relationship looks very much like what a neuron would do. So you can sort of imagine a little vehicle with a single neuron connecting the sensor to the motor that has some cord, it's kind of a step function like this. Uh, I've got to write some JavaScript. Um, So if T sense is less than, let's say, 0.15, uh, we'll make the velocity zero. Otherwise, we'll make it equal to T sense. So we'll, don't worry about the JavaScript. If you take the class, you'll have to worry about the JavaScript. <laughs> so. Speed of time, not 101, that's going to be too fast. So after a while you find all of these little guys uh, clustered in the cold areas of the environment, right? Avoiding the hot areas. Um, how many of you guys ever played with roly polies or sow bugs when you were a kid? Right? Where do you go to find them? You look under a board somewhere where it's wet and damp, or maybe the, the cracks along uh, the edge between your grass and the concrete. How did they find their way there? They basically use a form of orthokinesis. They wander around until they find an environment that makes them happy, <laughs> and then they stop and they stay there. Right? So, a lot of biological organisms end up in their preferred environments by slowing down and stopping when things are good. That's a life lesson for everyone in the room. <laughs> when things are good and it's going well, slow down and enjoy it. And if things are bad and you're catching a lot of heat, just keep on going because <laughs> eventually, right? Eventually you'll come out the other side. All right, so that's, that's orthokinesis in a, in a nutshell. It applies from single-celled organisms all the way up to, uh, to humans. Um, what about, instead of speed, what if we controlled turn angle? So how would you use turn angle to try and get them to stay in the blue areas or stay in the red areas? So you might think, okay, well, maybe when they're in, uh, let's say let's try and get them to stay in the hot areas. Maybe when they're in the hot areas, they should have a really high turn angle because we saw earlier when we were wandering, they, Looked like it was kind of staying in the same place. And then when it's cold, maybe they should go straight. If you go against the gradients. 
Well, we'll get to gradients in just a minute. So right now, we're just giving our little guy instantaneous information about what it sees right now. It's much better to look at the change in the stimulus rather than the stimulus itself. So one more simulation away and we'll look at that uh, strategy. But if you don't take a derivative, you either, to, to go with the gradient, you either have to think about changes in time or changes in space, right? Which is what all brains do. But if you don't Get on a pair of skis do that, and stand on a hill. Right? And you'll, <laughs> exactly. So let's, what are we doing here? We're going to try positive clino. So this is called clinokinesis as opposed to orthokinesis. Um, I have some old code in here. So speed is always going to stay one. The turn angle, we're going to scale in proportion to the temperature, right? So when it's very hot, it's going to turn a lot. When it's cold, it's not going to turn very much. And these are the sorts of things, I really didn't say that in the intro. I know a lot of folks here at uh, Beckman and elsewhere are starting to develop little uh, bio-inspired robots, little microbots and nanobots uh, that you want to, I don't know, have them inject into the circulatory system and end up at the uh, site of the cancer or, um, you know, you can think of all sorts of applications um, where you want your agents to end up somewhere in space. So these sorts of strategies that we're talking about now, kinesis and, and taxis, are very effective um, for that sort of uh, application. If you, if you kind of watch these guys, they, they certainly they wiggle around a lot more when they're in the, the warm areas and uh, maybe a little less. But, but our mean temperature it's still 0.5. We had a good idea, we thought, right? That we use this turn angle and make them turn a lot when it's hot and make them not turn very much when it's cold. Turns out that doesn't work. Um, when, they're, when you're controlling this, this noise, you can think of it, it's like a diffusion process, right? The little bots are, are diffusing in space. We've controlled the rate of diffusion but basically what diffusion does is just spreads everything out in time. So even though the diffusion rate's higher here and, and lower here, it turns out there's nothing that kind of aggregates the agents in one place or another. How can we fix that? We'll go to the, uh, the suggestion. Maybe just in, rather than just looking at temperature, we should look at how temperature is changing, right? And um, this is, we'll call this adaptive clinokinesis. So rather than just turning based on the temperature, we'll turn based on the change in temperature. And that's actually what, this was discovered by bacteria uh, billions of years ago. Uh, it's often called the run-tumble strategy. And I think it's already coded here. I won't go through the details of the code, but basically what we're going to do is we're going to sample the current temperature, then move, sample the new temperature, and compare the two. Other ways we can compute a derivative, but here we'll just kind of do it explicitly by comparing the temperature on two time steps. And so what should our rule be? Let's say we want to go up the gradient and get to the hot spots. If things are improving, keep on going, don't turn. If things are getting worse, pick a new random direction. Okay, so uh, the code is here. By default, you'll go straight. If the temperature's decreasing, turn by a random angle. It's called run tumble. And so 
Now all of the, uh, the guys have climbed, it was, they skied up the hill instead of skiing down the hill, but we could flip it around and make it do the other. They've all climbed their local hill, right? So uh, even, even this little guy is stuck on kind of a local uh, maximum in here, but basically wherever they are, they start heading uh, across the terrain. As long as things are getting better, they keep on going. When they start seeing a decrease, they randomly pick a new direction. And, uh, and you can see these guys are uh, sitting around uh, at, at the maximum. So. But it looks like uh, they failed to find the global optimum. For, they, for the exactly. And global optimization is challenging for computer scientists and for organisms. Uh, and so almost always organisms end up finding local solutions, whether you're thinking in terms of evolutionary time scale or thinking in terms of foraging. Uh, there are strategies. Uh, if you wanted to find global optimum, you might spend time wandering and sampling the environment and finding out what's, what's best in my local environment. You need a telephone. So, <laughs> and, well, you can, uh, yeah, we're probably not going to get to social communication, but like an ant nest, right, they, they send out thousands of ants, go find food, and then come back and leave a trail to where the food was, and then each individual doesn't have to act in isolation. They can pool knowledge, or honeybees do the same thing. They fly out, forage for flowers, the one finds nectar, comes back to the hive, he does, it's called a waggle dance. There's a little dance on the hive that tells the other bees where the food is, how far away it is, and how good it is. So uh, that's very good. So I'm gonna wanna leave time for more discussion. Let me just show you one more thing in simulation and then we'll, uh, so this was, this was all sort of these little vehicles uh, like this, single sensor, single motor. We talked about the importance of spatial, oh, of, of derivatives, derivatives in time, which is something all neurons, especially sensory neurons, tend to respond more to changes in stimulus strength rather than absolute stimulus strength. Um, changes in space, well, one way to, uh, to measure, two ways to measure changes in space, you could do what the little these guys did run tumble. You could sample it at one point and then you could move and sample it at another point. That gives you two points in space. Or you could add a second sensor and we'll, for fun, we'll add a second motor. Imagine that somehow in the evolution of these little abstract vehicles, they duplicated themselves. And now you have a vehicle that has uh, two sensors and two motors. And we can connect the sensors to the motors and if you think about it, um, you can either connect them crossed or uncrossed, right? So these guys could connect like this, and this could connect like this, or uh, you could do it like this. If you did both, like if this one connected to both and this one connected to both, then we sort of collapsed it back down to the single, single sensor, single motor. Um, so this, this is actually a famous vehicle, Breitenberg, I told you wrote this book called Breitenberg Vehicles, and this is the most famous form of a Breitenberg vehicle, and it's what almost every kid that takes a robotics workshop builds. You take a little RC car that has two wheels, you put a couple of light sensors um, on the front, and you connect the sensors to the motors, and you can make these vehicles do lots of interesting things. Basically, you can make them do four classes of interesting things. As if you think um, about kind of the, uh, the matrix of connections here, uh, it could either be crossed connections or it could be uncrossed. And then the connections could either be excitatory, meaning when you connect it to the motor, it makes it go faster, or you could connect it to the motor and make it go slower. So you have crossed or uncrossed, excitatory or inhibitory connections. Let's say you had crossed excitatory connections. And imagine you have a little light source over here like a, like a flashlight. This sensor is gonna be closer to the source. 
It's going to be more excited than this sensor. You can imagine this kind of falls off like inverse square law. And right now these sensors we're just imagining as sort of omnidirectional, kind of like when you walk outside in the sunshine, you close your eyes and you're trying to find a sunny spot or a shady spot. You're not really seeing form detail, you're just assessing is it light or is it dark? That's sort of what these uh, sensors act like. Uh, Crossed excitation, the side that's closer to the light is going to drive the opposite wheel faster. So this guy's going to turn toward the light. And the closer it gets to the light, the faster it's going to go, right? So uh, I'll pull up a simulation of those guys. The Breitenberg vehicles. Uh, and there's a little, he wrote a little book. Um, it's only, I don't know, 150 pages, a little paperback. At the end of his career, he was a, a neuroscientist and a cyberneticist. And at the kind of end of his career, he tried to sort of do what have I learned <laughs> after 30, 40 years and, and put together these little. Uh, these little examples. So here we'll just have an environment with a, uh, a single light source. And here's our vehicles, two sensors, two motors. So this guy's kind of uh, obsessed, but that, that that's one of the, uh, let me move the, uh, light source around. So it's kind of like when you've got a dog treat and, <laughs> you know, the, the dogs are very obsessed. So Breitenberg called these aggressive because they come straight for the target. The closer they get, the faster they get. In his little thought experiment, he said, and if these were light bulbs, it would be like they crash into them and shatter them. Uh, and uh, like them going to the plane. Yeah, so uh, let's just change the connections. Instead of crossed excitation, let's have uncrossed excitation. Okay, what's going to happen there? Think about that little diagram. Now this wheel that's on the side closer to the source is going to go faster. It's going to turn away, right? Um, <coughs> Breitenberg called those uh, cowards. They basically turn away from the light and they slink off into the corners um, and hide, essentially, right? And if you try to, uh, to, to, to bring a light source close to it, they just, they don't really want to have anything to do with it, right? And you could, so it's, it's kind of fun. I mean, that's one of the things that's fun about, about the course is actually building little agents that, that do interesting things. All right, so that's, uh, it's coward. So the other connections we haven't explored yet are inhibitory connections where the motors slow down. So for, to make that work, let's give the motors kind of a positive bias. So without any stimulus, the vehicle just drives around, wanders. Uh, but when there's a stimulus, it slows a wheel down. How are you going to get it to turn toward the light? You're going to want to slow down. So we've got our two sensors, our two motors. If you want it to turn toward the light, you're going to want to slow down this wheel. Right, so if these are inhibitory connections, slow down this wheel more than you slowed down this wheel, then that's going to cause it to turn toward the light. But it's going to give you something qualitatively different than the aggressive behavior. Breitenberg called this love. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, 
he said, they approach the light and they sit around and and worship it <laughs> and, uh, from, from afar. You know, they're they're deferential. They uh, they have their preferred gifts. That's because we've got a positive bias on the wheels, right? And then the sensor stimulus is slowing them down. And at some point, there'll be enough stimulus to cause the stimulus component to cancel the bias component, and they'll come to a stop. Right? So this is the uh, the love behavior. And then the other one um, is called Explorer. So this is inhibitory, but crossed. And the agents avoid the light, but they don't mind coming close to it. So they actually, uh, unlike the cowards, the one kind of hid in the corner, these guys he called explorers. They seem to be more interested in kind of checking out the light and then turning away. So Breitenberg's point of this part of his book was if these were animals and you were watching them in the lab or in your fish tank, you would probably attribute high level motivations, internal states, saying, oh, those guys are really aggressive, those guys are scared, these guys are uh, inquisitive. When in reality, what's inside the box is much simpler than what you tend to attribute it. So I guess there's, there's two take home messages here. One is you have to be very careful when assessing animal behavior in terms of making assumptions about what's going on inside. But sort of more to the point of our story, um, it doesn't take much, just a couple of neurons, to get really interesting behaviors, orthokinesis, uh, taxis. And so if you imagine sort of the, the time course of, of evolution, uh, how, how did this whole process get bootstrapped? Doesn't take much in terms of neural hardware to get circuitry that can do something useful to the organism. <laughs> move it toward food, move it away from predators, et cetera. Maybe I'll take a pause there and open it up for, uh, for thoughts and discussion so far. Does anyone? Can you make them train or so, learn so, from the past? Yeah, so um, that's sort of after spring break. <laughs> so <laughs> we spent the first half of the course sort of building up uh, these hardwired organisms and seeing what they could do. And then after spring break, we get into uh, to learning and memory. Maybe that's a good point. Um, why don't you hit the, can you hit the off button for me there? It'll, it'll turn, it'll cool itself off. I think it'll, there you go. So now let's, let's spend a little time, yeah. So I want to make an outrageous statement, but I don't think it's very outrageous. I see how you react to this. Yeah. So a brain um, is possibly the least interesting part because it's just a state machine. And you're showing state machines. The interesting part are the sensors, both the motor sensor and the receiving sensors. Now, I study the ear, so I'm bias towards hearing, <laughs> yeah. but um, I, you know, the sensors are where all the action is. I agree, I agree. Is that the, outrageous enough? I mean, uh, that's one of the pa papers that we read in, <laughs> in the class. So imagine this, uh, this little guy. He has a sensor, he has an actuator, and he has a brain that connects the two. What is evolution going to be able to do to the brain to make this guy smarter? He has a very limited view of what the world is. If this is a, a sensor uh, that's only recording, worst case, it would be a binary sensor. Either temperatures above a threshold or below a threshold would just be one or zero. Um, Basically, the brain is mapping from this space, kind of the percept space, to the action space. Here you have a very low dimensional percept space. You have a very low dimensional action space. You're not going to gain 
much by adding complexity in between those two simple spaces. The way that evolution really took off was by elaborating the sensory space and by elaborating the motor space, more so on the sensory side. If you think about the, the motor repertoire of animals, from bacteria all the way up to humans, the essentials for motor behavior are essentially locomotion. You need to be able to get from point A to point B, and you could do it on two legs or four legs or 100 legs, or you could, could swim or, or slither. But basically, all of those are locomoting you between two points. And then the other kind of important innovation is grasp. If you can pick something up, whether it's with your, your beak or your mouth or your talons or your hands, being able to uh, grasp something. So uh, I used to have a, an aquarium at home and, and watching uh, fish build their nests by going up and picking up little pebbles in the mouth and then spitting them out in the corner and building structures. So being able to move from A to B and being able to somehow manipulate objects in your environment, that's sort of the, the scope of this side of the, uh, of the mapping. This side has gotten incredibly complex over the course of evolution. You think of all the modalities and all the different Submodalities within chemical sensing, for example, all the different subtypes of chemical structures you might want to, to recognize. As this elaborates in complexity, the things that the brain can then do to pull out useful substates for guiding behavior grows exponentially. So, so, I, so I agree that sensor evolution and, and motor evolution and brain evolution have to all proceed together. And I'll try and make a summary diagram that kind of puts all that um, together. This is one of the summary diagrams we use uh, in class. So here's our, uh, our environment. Uh, here's this is going to be our organism. Actually, the organism is embedded in the environment, but we'll kind of draw them as, as separate. Um, we're going to have uh, sensors. Maybe I should draw them at the interface here. They're sort of the interface between the, uh, the external world. And these will be our actuators. I'll call them for motor. But So the uh, physical uh, features of the environment, light, sound, temperature, interact with a special subset of cells, sensory cells, that convert those external stimuli into another representation if these are neurons, this will be like membrane potentials and firing rates of neurons. Um, we'll call it, it's kind of a loaded uh, word, but this is sort of the physical features of the environment, and these are the internal representations <laughs> of those features. Uh, the, uh, the brain, the piece in the middle is only going to see these. It's only going to see nerve cell spikes. Features. It could, how this is structured, right, is, but it's in a, it's in a neural representation, whereas the stuff out here was in a physical. This, this axis is a very important one. Um, called the semantic axis. It's what's the relationship between internal brain states and external environmental state. And so if you're doing a, uh, an experiment in the lab where you're presenting visual stimuli or auditory stimuli to a subject and you've got an electrode in here and some sensory neuron, you're looking at what are the transformations along the semantic Axis. What do these internal firing patterns have to do with what's going on in the external world? So I teach a course in speech, and one of the things that I learned about was psychophysics. And in psychophysics, they make a very clear distinction between the physical word and the internal words. Mm -hmm. Pitch and frequency, intensity and loudness. Everybody says, how loud is the signal? 
Well, that's an internal representation. It's not the physical that's representation. This is a very important concept to get. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So. Um, and sort of on the other side of our diagram, you can think of these uh, still represented in neural uh, terms, neural firing rates. Uh, so sort of action or uh, like our little bot that was deciding, should I stay here or should I move a decision state, which was driving uh, a motor actuator, which then ended up influencing uh, the state of the system, the position, location of the agent and its environment. Again, this is still semantic. This is, so this is the sensory semantics, how our external uh, physical stimuli are related to internal uh, states. This is sort of the, the motor system semantics, how the particular patterns in motor cortex and spinal cord correspond to actions that are generated in the environment. And our, uh, our coordination piece that sits in here is, is coupling uh, perception, action, um, dynamic loops. And there's, there's feedback within here as well, but we won't, won't try and should be using different colors. Uh, this axis, the transformations that happen along this, um, one way to think of it is the, uh, the syntactic axis. This is, this is some neural firing pattern it's being converted into another neural firing pattern and some other neurons which is being converted. This is like the programming language of the brain. How does the brain take its internal representation and manipulate it? When we built our little simulation, our syntax was JavaScript. In the brain, the syntax is cellular and molecular states. That's actually what the name of the subgroup is in, in Beckman. It's called Cellular and Molecular Foundations of Intelligent Behavior. It's basically studying this. I mean, you've got to look at this, this piece too. But looking how do the neurons in the brain interact with one another to accomplish particular information processing uh, tasks. This, the syntactic axis, you could actually uh, expand. There's a famous. Uh, neuroscientist and uh, computational neuroscientist named David Marr, who said, when you're thinking about this axis, you can uh, think of it hierarchically. There's a, uh, there's a computational level that is at a higher level than syntax. Syntax is you're worrying about and for neurons, sodium channels and potassium <laughs> channels and synaptic plasticity, the details of like the neural programming language. But those interactions are, are accomplishing something computational, some transformation. So for our little vehicle that was doing orthokinesis, it was a pretty simple transformation, right, from an internal state that represented external temperature was being transformed into an internal state that then got turned into a motor velocity. So the computation was just like a linear equation, but it was like a y equals mx plus b kind of computation. That doesn't say, are you going to do that with a neuron? Are you going to do that with JavaScript? Are you going to do that with a piece of analog VLSI? Right? It's the computational principle independent of the implementation. Um, it's the mathematical representation. So it could be. Um, right. And then, uh, in this case, this probably isn't. Uh, here, the algorithmic and computational kind of collapse because they're, uh, but imagine that the computational was to find the maximum of something. There are lots of algorithms that you can use to find a maximum. Uh, you could do, uh, sampling and searching, you could do hill climbing. So there, there, there's lots of algorithms that can implement a particular computation. And then below that 
is the, uh, the implementation level. How do you actually build it in hardware or code it in code? So when we talk, talk about this as the syntactic axis, um, it's sort of looking at, at this piece, but realizing that above those pieces are the, the questions of what algorithmically, so those neurons are interacting with one another, what are they doing algorithmically, and what computation is that performing? And then one more piece, and then I'll stop. So where does natural selection fit in to all of this? There's one more, it's not really an axis. For some particular sensory motor dynamic coupling, it's going to have an effect on this agent's performance in its environment. So imagine it's an agent that's looking, it's got to require food, resources to grow and develop and reproduce. So there's going to be another process that kind of evaluates and selects. So in natural environment, that's natural selection. If you're an engineer, these are your, your design iterations and you're trying different things out and you're picking the best ones. Um, so um, there's feedback from the environment about what's working and then uh, selection, variation selection acts on sensors. Maybe you can improve performance by evolving better sensors, ones that can detect something different than what you were uh, detecting before. Maybe you can adapt what you're doing in the transformation between the input states and the output states. Maybe you gain traction by making your actuators a little bit better. Right, so, so natural selection sits here in the middle and acts on all of these pieces to optimize the dynamic coupling, to optimize the performance of the agent in its environment subject, subject to whatever selection pressures there are. So let's pause there and... Uh, <coughs> Yeah, so if, if, if we add another, uh, another layer <laughs> of the board, so there's the piece of this that is encoded genetically, uh, that's sort of how are organisms wired, how is a cockroach wired, how is a rat wired, um, that carries information about what's been successful for the species over the course of multiple generations. Right, so it's, it's learning on evolutionary timescales. Layered on top of that, and, and very important for what brains actually do, is another layer that connects sensory data to, uh, to coordination, to motor action, that depends on what experiences the agent has had in its own lifetime. So what's been successful for the agent over the course of uh, its experience with the environment. And in, in that context, it's actually useful to think about this, this sensory input or these sensory, uh, these physical states in the environment. You can s kind of subdivide them into two broad categories. Let me make this a wider area, arrow. Um, there's a subset of things in the environment that are causal causal as they relate to the fitness of the organism. So food, if you don't have food, the organism dies. If it's too hot, the organism dies. If there's no water, the organism dies. It's actually these causal influences, or the causal in the environment, that feed in to the selection. Those are the things that the organism has to get food, it has to get water, it has to avoid uh, extreme environments. There's another set of sensory inputs coming in that you can think of as informative as opposed to causal. And it turns out most of the things that we think about that we experience in the world are actually informative, not causal. Think of human vision. You're detecting photons, 
bouncing off of everything around you in the world. And then you're constructing internal representations of features and being able to recognize faces and chairs and tables. But all of that is just carried by photons bouncing around. Those photons are not causal in the sense of influencing your survival directly. They're informative because they can tell you, oh, I'm hungry and there's a sandwich over there and I'm going to go get it, right? But if you think of the world divided like this, informative things, so usually things like vision, hearing, Sorry. <laughs> uh, odor, smell, fall into that category. Things over here, uh, food, water, gravity. It turns out a lot of learning is associative learning, learning the informative cues that predict causal influences. So if you're going to train an animal in the laboratory, you pair some stimulus, usually some informative modality. You flash a light or you play a sound. And then when the agent does what you want, you give them a piece of food, some juice. So inside, in, in the learning and memory layer, there's a layer that's specialized for building up associations between the informative and causal influences. And the causal influences are the, uh, the driving force behind the reinforcement learning. And there's a whole neuromodulatory system, the dopamine system devoted to modulating brain state based on uh, rewards, and particularly unexpected rewards that weren't uh, predicted. So, yeah, there's a whole, <laughs> whole layer of complexity uh, dealing with how to predict what's been successful during the course of the animal's own experiences. So, so time is short. Uh, if you propose, I mean, think about very big scale. What gives rise to consciousness? What gives rise to what <laughs> we do compared to animals? Right. right? Is there right. Any, any understanding at all? Of yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's very controversial. My, my take on it is that the, um, in this learning and memory system, animals are trying to learn predictions of what actions are going to be successful given my past experience. And I think what humans have done and primates is to elaborate that system to the point where we basically are able to run internal simulations of this whole thing. We can sort of imagine um, scenarios and play them out and you know, social interactions, that whole thing you, you run through in your head. And I think that ability to have like an internal representation of self, a model of self that you can manipulate and then relate between the internal representation of self and the external self. Somehow consciousness is, is tied up in being aware that, that there's an external representation of your internal representation. Maybe. I don't know. So, do you have thoughts? So it some, seems like a big leap, right? As far as we know, some animals are a little bit smarter than the others, but there's a huge leap with the language for the humans. Right. Um, Human communication. You haven't really brought that up, and you know the fact that two people can talk to each other and send and semaphore ideas back and forth. Yeah, is exactly. Super critical. This is what you've been doing for the last hour. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, so you can't leave that part out. No, you can't. So you've got to replicate a bunch of these, and then you've got to include the information flow between agents. The communication. The channels. communication channels yeah. and. And emotional communication. It's, uh, it's really interesting to look at um, emotion as a communication channel, so facial expression, et cetera. Um, 
So there's, there's a theory getting back to what, what happened. Um, there's a set of neurons in cortex, premotor cortex called mirror neurons that respond not only when an individual does an action, but when they see another individual performing that action. And this was kind of unexpected. The researchers had electrodes planted <laughs> in this region of, uh, of cortex. And they were, I don't know, looking at reaching movements or something. And all, the neurons were responding not to the monkey's reaching movements, but to the experimenter's <laughs> reaching movements. And so at, at some point um, along the way to this sort of conscious representation of self, there was sort of this set, stepping stone of being able to interpret others' actions from your own reference system. And so that's, that's certainly been seen in, in primates. Um, I'm not sure about the evidence in, in rats, but there's a sort of a stepping stone. There's a big potential for a jump in evolution on the motor side, then, because you said that the sensory side is exponentially growing, yeah. but the motor side hasn't. I don't know. I, I, I think this, this side, there, there is some room, but um, one of the, I worked for years on electric fish, um, and electric fish sensor environment. Uh, using electric fields. And it turns out one of the things that's unique about electric fish is they have a tremendously enlarged cerebellum. Like for us, the cerebellum's a little structure that sits on the back of the head, and, and these fish, the cerebellum's larger than the, than the forebrain. The cerebellum is normally thought of as a center for sensory motor integration. And if you look at the fish, their, their motor repertoire is not that much different than other fish but their sensory processing, this distributed electric sense, um, requires a lot more uh, sort of combinatoric uh, processing. So I guess my bias is that sensory evolution has driven most of the complexity and that there may be some interesting things still to happen on the motor side, but it's sort of niche, niche specific. Way too much. Yeah, right. So. <laughs> so I think we're going to stop there. Thanks a lot, Mark. Sure. If you have additional questions, I'm sure Mark would be uh, happy to answer them. Yep. Before you escape, we're interested in um, your feedback, ideas for future talks, how you'd like to spend your lunchtime on Friday in the summer. What you'd like to listen to, if you have like, ideas on people, or if you have them to want to give um, a presentation yourself. So uh, please include that in the list. And uh, uh, thanks again, Mark. Great, thanks. That was cool. So, what a thing is like.